Next on our list of new features, yet another great improvement that I know a lot of people, including myself, have been waiting and hoping for for a long time. A great new feature concerning color correction, which was just barely available through some third-party plugins in one form or another, but still not the same way or quite as powerful as this. And having something built in is obviously always preferred anyway. That thing being the new comparison viewer, which can be found in the window menu in the show and workspace submenu. Selecting this or simply hitting a shortcut, control command six, opens the comparison viewer to the left of the standard viewer window. In this case, the first thing I see is a very similar image displayed as the one I see on the right. But if I skim over my clip or timeline, we see that only the image on the right changes, but the one on the left stays static. That's because if we look at the bottom of the comparison viewer window, we can see by its blue highlight that next edit is selected. In other words, we're seeing the first frame of the next clip in my timeline relative to my playhead. So if I skim over the second clip, the comparison viewer goes black since now that is what is next in the timeline, nothing. But if I park my playhead over the second clip, I can of course simply switch to previous edit after which the first frame of the previous clip is displayed. We can also see that two clips are not color corrected the same and look noticeably different. That's because I've only corrected the second, but not the first clip. But on top of it all, the overall lighting changed in between the two takes as well. In other words, if that were not the case, then I could of course simply copy the second clip with command C, select the first clip and hit command shift V to use the paste attributes command to paste the same three color correction filters that I applied to the second clip to the first clip as well and everything would look fine. But after doing that, thanks to the new comparison viewer, I can see that there is still an obvious discrepancy between the two. So until now, I had to constantly move my playhead or skimmer between the two clips to get a fair comparison to match them up as best possible. Obviously a rather tedious and not very user-friendly experience, but that is of course now history. I can just stop at any point in my clip, go into the color inspector and adjust my exposure and saturation as needed to match both shots perfectly. Opening the scopes window, which no color correction should be without, with command seven, it opens to the left of my viewer. But if I activate the comparison viewer window by clicking on it and hit command seven again, a second scopes window opens to the left of it, which can be individually customized and is of course great for making sure that I get both images graded as close to each other as the footage allows. And once you're at this point, Suddenly the option to display your scopes vertically via the respective view menus suddenly makes that much more sense and makes for that much better use as well. Because after doing that, we can see that even on this fairly dinky screen, I'm given an amazingly powerful and useful color correction layout. Give this whole thing a more appropriately large screen and it starts making even that much more fun. This in itself is of course great, but what do I do if the two shots I want to compare are not consecutive in the timeline? When for example, as in this case, there's a cutaway to an entirely different shot in between the two. Or maybe even the first frame of the previous or next edit isn't the one I need or want for comparison. Or the clip I want for comparison isn't even in this project, but rather in a different one within my library. Well, for all of the above, we have a second tab at the top of the comparison viewer window called saved. If we switch over to it, we see Nothing. Of course, because as the name says, it displays saved images and I haven't in fact saved anything yet. But I can of course do that very easily by simply positioning my playhead over the frame that I want in my timeline and then clicking the save frame button at the bottom right of the viewer. With that, the comparison viewer, or rather in this case, we'll call it a frame store, is populated with the image from my timeline and I can now return to my third clip and adjust my color correction accordingly. I'm able to store up to 30 images per a library and these are in fact stored within the library until I delete them. To see how many and which frames I've stored so far, I just need to open the frame browser window by clicking the button at the bottom left of the comparison viewer. Here I'm showing all of the images that I've saved from any and all projects within this library. Meaning that any and all frames that I have saved in any given project within the same library, so even from a different event, will appear here and I can use them as a comparison in any project at any time. Maybe as a little extra pro tip, 
There's also a new entry in the command editor for saving a frame, but it doesn't actually have a shortcut assigned to it by default. So if this is something I see myself needing a lot, I can simply open the command editor with option command K, search for save frame, and simply drag this command to whatever shortcut I would like to use. For example, F8. Then save the new command set, and from now on, if I go back to my concert video, for example, and skim across it, wherever and whenever I press F8, that frame is automatically saved to my frame browser. And since, as I said, these are accessible within any and every project within the same library, I can return to my interview project and select any of the frames that I stored from the concert video to use as a comparison in the comparison viewer. If I want to delete any of the saved frames, I simply select them in the frame browser and hit delete. But assuming I've hit my 30 image limit, starting with the 31st image, they would automatically be deleted starting with the oldest first. As an additional little tip, if you look inside the library itself, you can now find a new folder called underscore snapshots at the top level. Here, you'll actually find any and all snapshots that you've saved in full quality and resolution as a TIFF, even if they all have very cryptic names. In other words, if I were to pass this library over to somebody else or even just open it on another machine, I'd still have access to any and all snapshots made by myself or even someone else. Very nice. Next up, just a little improvement for those of you for whom 360 degree VR video is of any interest. Here, Apple has added an additional mapping option for VR material that you might be using in a regular HD project, namely the popular tiny planet effect. So now if I'm using a 360 degree VR clip in a non-VR project, as in this case, I can go into the Clips Inspector and under the Orientation section and Mapping, I now have an option to set it from normal to tiny planet. Again, something that until now was only possible with additional commercial plugins. Now with the mapping set to Tiny Planet, I can create those ever popular spherical looks. And using my roll and tilt parameters, I can wrap my Tiny Planet effect into an infinite cylinder. Adjusting the pan parameters moves my subject horizontally within the Tiny Planet, and I can animate the field of view to transition from a close up to a satellite view as if I were flying high above my footage. And this of course goes for 360 degree titles and generators where I can also create a powerful warped look by applying the tiny planet mapping option to them. Of course, animatable as well. Oh,